Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. We are thrilled to have New York Times best-selling author Richard Paul Evans with his new book. It's the first of a trilogy. It's called The Broken Road. You may all know him from The Christmas Box and The Walk. Richard, great to have you back at Anderson's in Naperville. It's always good to be here. Thank it you. It is so great to have you here. And with a new book, this is the start of a new trilogy, The Broken Road. And the series will be called The Broken Road? The Broken Road. The Broken right. Road. So I always want to know is because you publish so many books and having so many bestsellers. But with a book that comes out and you're starting a new series, what, what do your readers that absolutely love you and love just about everything you have written, but even, even those new readers, you know, to, to you and what you write, what are you hearing about this, this new trilogy? Good things, uh, surprisingly. I was, I was afraid for this one. I was afraid that, that it might be too dark. Um, Kirk's Reviews came out and said it was a well-written book, which is good to hear from Kirk. Oh, yeah, right? well, that's the mother but, of all. But, yeah, right. but they yeah. said it might, it, but it also might inspire pity or it's like Freud and Try. They go, what is that? So I look it up and it means to delight in others' pain. It's like, well, wow, they're like kind of sadism. It's yes, like, well, well, a different version of yeah, Schadenfreude. It's, yeah, that's why it's Schadenfreude. Thank you. Yeah, right. So, um, yeah. But it's, you know, it's, it, it was real. The book was yeah. authentic to me and that w was what was important to me. Yeah. So, for this book, where, where did the seeds start to grow? Because there are so many wonderful things in this book with the Chicago references, which makes it great for, for our, our region and our city around here. But, but where, did, where did the seeds start to grow for the character in this book and sort of a road trip, you know? So tell well, us Those that. are actually two different um, answers. Okay. So the, the, yeah. the road trip started with my series, The Walk. Right. The Walk is uh, wildly successful. I think we have a million half copies in print and it continues to sell to this day. And, right. and readers were saying, I want more. <laughs> you know, yeah, I want more right. of that. And they wanted me to have him walk again. I said, no, his story's done. We don't want to visit that. And I like the theme of The Walk. The Walk was about what happens when we have no reason to live. We've lost every reason to live. What do we live for? And so I wanted to have another walking book, or my readers did. It's yeah. like, well, let's have him walk for a different reason. Yeah. And so I decided to... I would like to explore what happens when you've lived the wrong life. Yeah. You've lived a life and then you don't like what's happened to it. So this is a story of redemption. So that, that's where the walking part came. Yeah. The actual character came from a real character in real life. He's a friend of mine who, when I met him, he was the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company. And then I, as I got to know him better, learned that he came from a very poor Utah home. I mean, it was surprising because that's how he came up because I'm from Utah and he right. was living in Los Angeles at the time. And that he had been horribly abused mm. and had gone through an awful lifestyle and how his life turned. And I thought, well, what an interesting story that is. So I combined the two stories and yeah. came up with this. Yeah. And, and I, I really like this character, Charles James. I mean, um, and, but he, I could, you know, I don't name any names, but there are people that you know out there, these, these celebrity sort of uh, financial gurus mm -hmm. who are, I mean, they're bigger than their message in a way because they're such celebrities. But they're telling people how they can change their lives through wealth and, and gaining that wealth. And But it's interesting that you chose a character who's involved in something like that and his celebrity, but what happens to him, um, it's interesting that his DNA is based in someone that you really uh, know. Well, and yeah. also that, that industry, I was in it for a while, and yeah. it, it shocked me. I, I, when I would see these guys go up on stage, I would go up on stage with them, and they would use my stories, I didn't realize for a while how they were making this work. Right. But I remember one time in 40 minutes we brought in almost a half million dollars. And, and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe the money that was coming through yeah. this. And these guys, would they were talking in the hundreds of millions of dollars in wow. sales. And it was like mental rape. Yeah. And I, as I watched how they did it, and they, they taught me some of their secrets. And it's like, 
I guess a little bit of me wanted to expose some of that, so I put right. it in the book. Yeah, no, and it. it's and, and there are those people out there, and it's so interesting that you chose someone like this as your main character in this. But it's it's, it's incredible when you watch those type of, and we weren't we weren't going to call it, well charlatans out there mm -hmm. in a way, but they sell their tickets, they sell their books, they do all these types of things, and and, and guaranteeing people that their lives will will be beyond you know rich and and. But the right kind of rich. That's not the right. kind of rich that they want. So his childhood, you know, in it. And what I loved about the book, and you, you've done this, you've used this vehicle or this tool in other books where you use diaries or journals to right. tell the story, which I think is so wonderful. But I love the way the book starts because you talk about Route 66, mm -hmm. you know, and it starts in Needles, California, sort of at the end of the road. It starts in a diner. And in a way, I want to know, there's a writer talking about this character because he meets them in, he meets him in this diner and it's sort of at, and, and I don't want to give too many spoilers away because it could be easy, <laughs> but tell us about you as the writer, sort of writing the writer who is now going to tell his story. Well, there's something beautiful about getting lost into a story that feels yeah. real. Yeah. And even though I was very clear at the walk that it was fiction, yeah. Um, people were still looking for him. People would send me right. letters of encouragement yeah. and, and say, well, Al goes to our, Alan goes to our city, let us know. Yeah. And so people want to believe in this. So when I wrote my first book, The Christmas Box, it was written first person and yeah. as if it had happened. And I was an old man. I was only 29 years old. Yeah, were... So I would go to these interviews and they would sit there. And finally, one time I got yelled at. He goes, when is the author going to get here? I, like, I am the author. It's like, no, the author's an old man. <laughs> no, I am the author. And, and so I, I did it, I used that same device with a book called The Last Promise, which right. is maybe my, my best book, you know, in terms of writing. Yeah. And um, I just, I liked that, I liked falling yeah. into it. And so this one, it just felt like that. It's like I wanted to interject myself in it. So just like Bridges of Madison County, which is the same way. That's right. You walk That's into right. it and you feel like, oh, this is a true story. Yeah, yeah. And I think you, you never know the, the writer who is going to tell this story or... It, it, has him tell his story, but you never know his name in a way. So, but with Charles James, you know, how do you think, you know, and, and without too many spoilers again, you know, he tells about his childhood through this journal and this diary, but the hurt and the pain and the abuse that he has gone through and what drives him to be the man that he does become in his career. I thought that was interesting to read the different entries because you started at the beginning of his life in these diaries, which is so cool. Well, um, and one of the things about his life is the big turning point is when he realizes that he's not been chasing success as he believed, that actually yeah. he's been running from his past, he's right. been running from the fear of failure. Yeah, yeah. So the quotes are great too at the beginning of each chapter, and I know you've done that before, and I love those that are so great because you can start each chapter that there's a quote from the diary at right. the beginning of each chapter. So my editor, who, at, who I have a new editor with this book, and she goes, just lose those. We don't need those. And I thought, you don't know my readers. <laughs> no, <laughs> yeah, you're, right, you're right. absolutely wrong. And right. immediately I right. started hearing from, you know, from sure, reviewers. Sure. That they're, they're really a yeah. great part of the book. Yeah, those are fantastic. So, but yeah. because of the way I write, I write very, very spare. My books have to move quickly. But I'm also a poet, you know, and I get yeah. these parts I love, and it's like, okay, I love it, but it slows down the book. If it slows down the book, it's got to go. Yeah, because the books have got to move, and so what I do, I put them in what I call the morgue. I put them aside, and then when I'm all done, it's like I can put them, I pull them back and put them at the beginning of the books as diary entries, so I get to keep this little beautiful yeah, part, and right. it doesn't disrupt the flow of the book. Right. So in the morgue, I love that. So these are the parts you cut out. So because it's it's that battle between the prose and the beauty of it, but also to moving the story along. Right. So you never, as a constant battle. It's, it, I mean, yeah. as a writer, you, you create these things and yeah. you, you fall in love right. with them. It's like, I don't want to lose that, but you know, I don't want to slow down my story. Right. So Chicago, there's a lot of references to Chicago from the bean to a lot of other things. And then Route 66. So so did you do any research or any traveling oh, of along course. Route 66 for this? Because oh, that would have oh, been a great trip. Of course trip. I did. I, I, yeah. You know, I spent the last five years driving America with the walk. It, it, yeah, when right. I first started that series, I thought I could actually write it and from you know Google Maps. Right. Until sure. I realized it's impossible. You have to get on the road. Yeah. So right. I knew that going into this one. So I went immediately to Chicago and start tracing down. It was a little bit hard because Chicago, not as bad as St. Louis, which is horrible, mm -hmm. but you know, the city's grown up around Route 66 and starts <laughs> chopping it up. And, yeah, right. And so you can't just drive, you're actually doing a lot of detective work. 
trying yeah. to find the find the route. Yeah. So any anybody that was interesting you met along the way? On those on those journals of your own? Oh, we met a lot of interesting people yeah. <laughs> okay. along the I'm way. I'm sure. Yeah. You know, the Cadillac Ranch and Harry's Rabbit Farm is just you just until you actually get out there and meet these people. And there's things you're excited to meet. I wanted to go to like Winslow, Arizona for the Eagles, right? And get there and see where, <laughs> where the song took place. And, yeah. um, there are just so many iconic places along Route 66. The thing that intrigued me though was to realize that there is this population that's always moving along Route 66. Right. There's always these people like these tourists, and most of them are foreigners. You would I would expect yeah. American well, Americans. Yeah. Right. No, I, I ran into some Finnish Harley riders, um, some Canadians in Corvettes, an Australian who was going the wrong way, and we met up in Kansas. He was, <laughs> "You try going the other way, mate." You know, going from <laughs> Los Angeles to Chicago. Right. The signs point the wrong way. Yeah. And right. um, I just asked some of them. It's like, "Well, why are you here?" It's like, "How do you even know about this?" He goes, "Well, the TV show." The TV show, we see it. And so they're actually, they come yeah. over by the hundreds or thousands and go travel Route 66. Yeah. I, there's something about that road and what it meant uh, to a lot of people in, in lore and, and everything. So it's interesting how that's translated to other countries yes. and people have come to do it. So the book is about second chances and what happens to them. We won't tell because you got to read it. you got to read it for yourself. And, and, you know, figuring out how do you really obtain that joyous and truthful life, which I think we're all searching for. But how many of us get that chance for that total reboot, you know, to, yeah, to do it over again? What happens to yeah. him is such a fantasy. Yeah. I, I've been asking crowds as I go on book tours around the country. And yeah. say, well, how many have had that fantasy right. of being able to just disappear and go off the grid and start all over again? And almost everyone has had at some point that fantasy. Right. It's like, that doesn't surprise me. I've thought of it many times. What if I just didn't go home? <laughs> you know, yeah, what if? Right, so, right. In fact, I had a, a schoolmate in, in high school that he actually, he was he made all this statewide news, maybe national news, because he disappeared. He was working at a at a gas station, a convenience store, and then just came in the morning and he was gone, and, and his car was there, and he was gone. They thought he was kidnapped. And came out six days later. He was just in midlife crisis. Uh -huh. And he had just run away right right but what happens to him in this book without spoilers again <laughs> i mean the business he's in and, and what he does and something horrific happens to somebody who is one of his basically followers in a way right? right so it's so interesting to know but that that road to redemption in a way which um there's there's a great book that's just coming out called redemption road but it's so interesting how the physical the literal trip compared to the one of the mind and the spirit right. because is, is so it, interesting. And because of the two trips going yeah, on. And so I'm right. fascinated to see what what he actually runs into. Right. And I'll probably come back and drive the route again. I was yeah. on a journey when I wrote this book. It was supposed to come out two years ago. Okay. And in the, in the midst of that, um, one of my kids entered one of the most difficult struggles of their life and got involved in some things that I wish he had of. And, yeah. and uh, it became very painful. And finally, after really struggling um, I just broke down I just I, I just called my publisher and I said look you have to sideline me coach because that's if I was if I was a basketball player I, I'm injured it's like my heart's broken I, I look at the computer screen and I can't even think about it and my publisher was l lovely I, that's all I can yeah, say they said right, right we had no idea just and they'd already paid me for the book I thought they'd be upset they'd already start selling it and they go don't worry about a thing yeah. just let us know when you're able to come back. And, and so that's why I dedicated the book to Jonathan Karp, who's the president of Sign yeah, Issues. Yeah, right, too. right. And, and a very good friend now. We were, yeah. we were good before, but now we're, I consider him a friend. And, and so this book was a very personal thing. So when I, when I came back and started writing again, I could see how much pain I was in. Right. It's like the book was very painful. I could right. see the anger I had, the hurt. It was just, it was, it was bleeding, you know, bleeding all over the pages. And, and so some of that's still in it, and I, I think yeah. that's good. Right. No, I think, it, and basically, it's sort of like his journey. You're putting, obviously, you put some of that in there. So it makes it even more truthful yes. in a way. So I want to know, how do you do this? How do you tell a story without being too heavy-handed with a message or to trying to teach something or even being so preachy? Because you, you have such a talent that you don't do that. How do you do that? 
probably <laughs> because I dislike that as much as you do. Okay. Well, no, but I mean, yeah. it's easy to go over the line sometimes with that sort of thing, but you don't do it because I, I think when you're done with it, you, you've gotten so much out of it without feeling like you, you, you know, been pushed through it. Yeah. You just, you um, not voluntarily. Indoctrinated. <laughs> yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, because, so, because that's not my point. I'm not trying yeah, to do that. Yeah. I'm, in, in writing the book, I like to ask questions about life and explore them. Yeah. And so it's more like inviting the right the reader on a journey with me. It's like let's just look at this, and we can talk. And I don't care what your faith is, or, or, or you have no faith. It's like okay. let's talk about this honestly. And so when someone asked me the other day, it's like why do you think so many people relate to your books? And they had just met someone who's, who was like, it's like I couldn't believe it. You like changed their life. They, you, you would think that you were like the, a, a relative to theirs. Right. So important. Yeah. I said I th I think my books are just honest. Yeah, I think yeah. that when they read it, it's like this guy's telling the truth. He's not afraid to talk about his own pain and what he's going through. Yeah. And, and so that's vital. Yeah. And I think this one, you can't read this book without looking, being a little self-reflective, obviously. You know? That's what I'm hoping for. And, and looking, you know, what would I have done differently? But how can I change it going forward? Right. right. Yeah. So, so great about that. Um, so you started as an author, and you you and I you kind of fell into being a published author in kind of kind of an interesting way, um, but you were an advertising executive, right? And you were writing commercials and and doing things like that, and then you wrote a small story that was really meant for just your family and friends, right? And it was for your your two daughters at the time, and that was 1993. And it was 87 pages? Is it was that actually right? 1992. Oh, 1992. 93 was the first time I published it. Okay. But 92, I went to Kinko's and made up 20 copies. 87 pages. 87 pages. And just this little story. The little story. So how, how did it end up selling eventually? I know it sold over 8 million copies. Tell us that journey of this book. And, and what, what, how did that all happen? <laughs> did well, that well all I, worked, happen? I worked extremely hard to fall into it. All. Okay, <laughs> all right. That. Okay. Um, yeah. What happened is... When I first wrote it, I just thought it would be something small, and I was fine with that. I was, I, yeah, and I'm glad I yeah. didn't have that expectation because it would have killed me otherwise. Yeah. I after I, I published the first 20 copies and handed them out, I thought it was done, but the book spread, it went viral, and that was before social media. This was like right. real viral, sure. where someone would read the book and then walk it over to their neighbor. And so, within four weeks of giving those books out for Christmas, they had been read 160 times. Well, wow. if a book is, has a read through of eight people, I, I mean, I was a marketing guy. It's like, okay, there's something really powerful about right. this. Right, sure. So that's when I sent it to publishers who all rejected the book. You know, they just went, didn't think this would sell. And I, I have great, I have a great, I told you so. I mean, it's like yeah. everyone, I, oh, yeah. everyone who I said bet. no lost probably $50 million. You know, it's like, okay, <laughs> right, too right. bad for you. So I decided uh, because of the response I was getting to self publish. So I self published the book. And that first year, I, I first printed up. Um, 7,000 copies. And this is how naive I was. I thought the average book here sold 1,000 copies. Yeah. And I could think of seven bookstores I, I thought I could get my book into. So I printed yeah. up 7,000 copies. <laughs> Not realize that the average book sold like two copies, right? Well, yeah. yeah right. So, so. And every, yeah, but right. this is, that's, that's a... <laughs> so I, I'm just completely naive. So I, I printed yeah. my 7,000 copies and they get out there and the distributor's like, no, no, no. You, if you sell 3,000 copies, this will be a huge local hit. Right. And so, but then the book starts to start to go and starts to go viral, and, and so I go back, print up ten thousand copies, which sell in three days. Oh my gosh. So I sell out before Christmas, and I start hearing stories of uh, people, get, women, getting into fistfights over the last copy of a book in the store. So it 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 starts to generate all this interest. Yeah, sure. So, so the right. next year, I printed up uh, four hundred thousand copies, again, completely insane. And um, I got an investor, I didn't have that kind of money, got an investor to get behind it and, sure. and figured, you know, it's kind of a five times return. So, um, and it just fought its way out there. Wow. It, w it was tough. It was tough because back then we had, we had bookstores like yours. We had thousands of right. bookstores. Yeah, there were a lot more of us. You, yeah. 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 That's what dominated the industry. And so you'd have to go and talk to everyone. Right. You couldn't just like throw it on Amazon one time and anyone can get it. Right. And so I had no distribution. Yeah. So I would do an. I started doing all these radio interviews, but then people would say, "Well, where's the book?" Yeah. So that that was a struggle, but it it eventually broke through, and the big hit was after it had sold. It was like the number two book at Walden's, and that got People Magazine's attention. So they ran an article, and the next day it came out, um, and the next day I got a phone call from the Today Show, and said, "We want you on with your daughters." 
So I flew back to New bad. York and it just, I was on with Katie Couric and the book just exploded. Yeah. So at that point it sold out everywhere. It debuts at number two on the New York Times bestseller list. And um, then people start offering me millions of dollars for this really yeah. unpublished book. Yeah. So that's how it, that, that's yeah. that's how it started. But you know, but I love that story of that first those first copies and then your first you know self published print run. But the beauty of handling handing a physical book that means so much to you to another person. I mean, to me, that's what that's how books spread. I mean, long before ebooks were even on anyone's horizon, you know. So that's a phenomenal thing to share something like that and actually physically hand that physical book to somebody and say, you've got to read this. Yeah, that's just a, a phenomenal story. So moving on, how did how was it to, do, to write your next book? Was it hard? Was it, was it difficult? Was it daunting? Oh, yeah. yeah, it was horrible. Yeah. My daughter, uh, Jenna, who's a writer now, yeah, she's going right. through this right now, her second book. Yeah. And she just met David Sedaris. Oh. He goes, oh, yeah. your second book. And he goes, oh, well, just... Don't worry about it. They're just going to crap all over you. <laughs> that like, sounds, yeah, David. That sounds like David. David's he goes, coming he goes, in. They, they're going to hate you. Just don't oh, yeah. worry about it. Just, right. get, just accept it. That sounds like it. him. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, it, it, the second book, they had already paid me even more money than they had for the first book. And I, it, I was really struggling with the book. It yeah. just, it, it was awful. Yeah. And then one day I had this uh, beautiful epiphany. I was out walking, which is what I do for writer's block. I'm walking. And then I had the most powerful inspiration of my life. I realized... I don't know how to write a bestseller. And that was the moment in some ways I became a writer. It's like, I have no idea how to write a bestseller. They paid me to write a bestseller, I don't know how to do it. Yeah. You know, they might have asked me to play the piano, I, I have no idea. Yeah. And it's like, all I know how to do is write something that matters to me. Right. Something that's very personal. The Christmas Box was an intensely personal book about these deep feelings I had as a father for these little girls who came in and just rocked my world. And I was so madly in love with them. And I just gave everything to them. Yeah. So when I wrote the second book, I thought, this is going to destroy me. But that's okay. I've had a lot of fun. This was great. Yeah. I'm going to write a book that I, that I like. Yeah. And so I wrote that book. And it was timepiece. And it, it hit the New York Times bestseller list. And be, was made into a movie with James Earl Jones. Yeah. And, right. and it did well. You know? yeah. and, and, and at that point, I realized, I have to write what matters to me. That's, that's all right. I know how to do. That's right. And write, well, you know, that whole thing about writing what you know, but also, too, I ask so many authors, you know, is there a particular audience that you have written this for? No, I just wanted to write this story, not even thinking of an age or anything. So whether you, you've, you've sat down and it ends up being a YA novel, that's not what they sat down, set out right. to do. So I think that's so important to write what, what's, what's meaningful to you because, obviously, that's what's going to succeed. Yeah. Right. Um, so... Um, 30 books. Oh, how many books now? I have no idea. I how many books? the 34th. 34th, 34th book. Yeah. And you have 30 consecutive New York Times bestsellers. Which 30, is 34 consecutive. Thir whatever, oh, my 34. Whatever, whatever, all of them have been New York Times. Is, yeah. That blows my mind. Yeah. <laughs> it really does. It is just incredible. So basically, from that first book you wrote, 24 copies, how has publishing changed or the experience changed for oh you goodness. to get the book to market? The world's changed a lot. Yeah. Um, completely, in fact. And so, I mean, the basics of writing a book are the same. Yeah. Um, the advantage I have is I have really wonderful readers, and many have stuck with me since the very beginning. And, um, but, I don't know. We've seen the event of e-books. We've seen mm -hmm. the, you know, the chain stores coming in, and then the mass, you know, merchants coming in, and then um, internet and. The, it, it's it's kind of shaking everything up. Like yeah. so parts of, parts of me get gets really nostalgic for yeah. the original right. day. Sure. I, I, used sure. to, I used to love that. Yeah, yeah. So outline or not to outline? I don't I don't outline till I'm mostly done with the book, and that's only to understand where I am. Okay. But so basically, as you're writing, you are surprising yourself as much as us. With some, with Completely. I, I'm just. I'm finishing the Michael Vay series right now. Huh. Been working on it for seven years. I only knew the ending two weeks ago. Oh, that's. I, so, I love that yeah, because I, it, was, it, I wasn't sure, yeah. I, and I knew it had to be big because yeah. who wants to end a series and not have a yeah. beautiful ending? Oh, exactly. So um, the walk series. I purposely went into it with the idea that I would just walk and see. So this is the same way with the broken road. Mm -hmm. I don't know if he gets the girl. Okay. I honestly don't know, and yeah. part of me thinks there's no way he'd get the girl. There's no woman in the world that would go back to him. Okay. <laughs> it's okay. Like, say no more. Say no more. <laughs> Wait, no, no more secrets. No more secrets. Okay. So, 
but with Michael Vay. And I know you did a couple of school events for us mm -hmm. to, today. And I wanted to tell you, we had a foreign exchange student last year, and he was from Indonesia. He absolutely adored mm -hmm. that series. So as soon as I got that advanced reader's copy of number six, oh my gosh, I could have given him the best gift in the world. Oh, fantastic. So knowing that you know English is his second language, he adores that series. So I'm going to send him number seven. <laughs> oh, good. But, that series, what is it like writing that young adult series? Because oh, it, is, it is so popular and, and knowing where, where that story comes from in a way. And I, I want you to tell I, us a little bit about your I love your Michael Bay. I yeah. mean, it's, I, I, when I stop writing that, it's, it, it's, I'm going to mourn because I just, I just adore it. But, but I really adore the kids. Um, it's fun. It, and it's actually closer to my personality than my adult novels in many ways. Okay. You know, I was that kid who used to go up and down this the street asking to rake, lo rake leaves so I could get the money and go to 7-Eleven and buy some comic books. So I, Michael Bay was something that was just yeah. near and dear. It was also the book that was rejected. And I remember my agent said, like, no one wants this book. And she was stunned. It's like, we yeah. thought Disney would take it for sure. No, nope, my own publisher didn't offer yeah. very much. It's, they always had very low expectations. And, and um, I said, don't worry about it. I said, because this, this book just feels right. It, yeah. I, I said, I haven't felt this way about a book since the Christmas box, yeah. and it came to me like the Christmas box, and that did okay. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. So yeah. Just a little. same thing. So it's yeah. interesting. The two books that were rejected both hit number one on the New York Times. Yeah. So so Michael Michael has some things that are similar for your son and yourself. Um, Michael it, Michael has Tourette syndrome. Right. I have Tourette right. Syndrome. And I think you probably get a you get a lot of responses from kids who come at you because here's Michael who does so much but he has a special power and what he can accomplish but what he he stands for what's good and I think you hear from a lot of kids who have issues or problems and they talk to you oh yeah and tell us just a little bit about that because yeah, I, I think it's phenomenal well, what I, was, that does. I, was, I was hoping that Michael Bay would make the world an easier place for my son I thought yeah. if Harry Potter had Tourette syndrome Tourette syndrome would be cool and so I was at a comic con a year ago and this young woman came up to me and she goes may I hug you yeah, and she hugged me and she goes, I love you, Mr. Evans. I go, why do you love me? She said, I have Tourette syndrome. And the kids tease me at school, and I don't know why they would do that. She goes, but then Michael Vay came along, and he's so popular at school that people now think it's cool I have Tourette's. So I'm, I, got a, I got a letter from a, woman, a young woman in France just a few days ago, uh, or actually a few weeks ago, and she wrote, Mr. Evans, you probably have been wondering where I've been. <laughs> which is really sweet. It's like, I asked my assistant, because she said it on, I go, do, do we know her? It's like, well, yeah, she yeah. writes every every few weeks. Oh, she has for like oh, several that's years. so cool. So go, yeah. She said, I'm, actually, I'm not doing well. I'm in the hospital, and um, I've been very sad, and I tried to kill myself. And she said, Michael Vay's my only friend in this world, and he's in the hospital with me, so I'm okay. And so, you know, it's Michael Vay to me is like this holy yeah. calling. I, yeah. I, I love writing yeah. it. I love reaching these kids. And I, and I love these kids who come up to me with disabilities. And if we have time, one more story. Um, a woman told me her, her daughter was so horribly abused that she wouldn't go to school. She goes, I couldn't take her. I took her to school. She would just walk home. She goes, yeah. there's nothing I could do. And uh, she said, one day I'm getting ready for work, and my daughter comes down dressed for school. And I said, well, what are you doing? She goes, I'm going to school. Yeah. She goes, why? <laughs> like, yeah. She yeah. said, Look, if Michael Vay can face the Elgin, then I can face his kids at school. Yeah, yeah. I was like, yes. <laughs> but you see, that's the power of what books can do. And so exactly. that's what you're giving so many kids that that is, that's beyond everything. That's, that is the power of, of reading and, and great characters and everything. So what's coming next? So I did mention about, you have, tell us about number seven. So the final book. Can't it's, be it's, the final it's book. It's due in a month. I, if we, I, I mentioned we are, um, we are, moving ahead hopefully with the tv series yeah if that happens okay. i may write a trilogy for michael Vay after oh, because again yeah. I'm, I'm just having part of me says stop writing it let it just yeah. exist in its own right. realm and be sure. done. another part is like so reluctant to let go i don't want to send my kid off yeah. to college <laughs> it's like yeah. no no yeah. don't go so so that's that's next with michael Vay. i okay. have um Right now, Hallmark is producing my next Christmas book, The Mistletoe Inn. Right. And then next year, they'll do Mistletoe Secret, because Mistletoe Promise was such a huge success sure. for them. Right. And so, um, so I have Michael Vane, and then I have a Christmas story coming out this fall. Right. And then I start all over again. I come out with the next book in the Broken Road series. Or Broken Road series. Yeah. So, okay. Well, Richard, thank you so much. Congratulations on the first book of the trilogy, The Broken Road. 
And thank you for bringing us Michael Vay. There are many <laughs> kids who absolutely adore that series. My pleasure. Thank you. Great conversation with New York Times best-selling author Richard Paul Evans with his new book. It's the first in a trilogy. It's called The Broken Road. If you read this one, you won't be able to wait for number two. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed. <laughs> <laughs>